Hello, everyone. Ah, here. Perfect. So, accessible JavaScript pattern as in web accessibility. First off, this is me, Garance, but I know that my name is unpronounceable if you're not French, so you can call me Flor. That works, and that's what I use in Spain. You can find me on Twitter, and I'm going to put a lot of links over there uh, of what I'm going to talk about, so you don't have to like frantically type uh, while I show them. Uh, so I'm in Barcelona at Marfil. We're a product company. And when I think about web development, what I really love is web accessibility. Because, like he just said, I, websites should be fast, but easy to use as well. So this is why I'm talking about this today, and I guess you're interested as well. So let's see. I will first go briefly over the, spa the place of web accessibility in web development today. Then I'll show you how to make a great navigation menu, and then how to make a great user experience when you design models, dialogues, I mean. And if I still have time, uh, I will show, give you resources that you can put in place in your project today, or um, just to learn more about how web accessibility works and what you should be doing. So first, for the place of web accessibility in today's developments, let's think about us as developers. How is, how is our daily life? I'll take my company as an example, but I'm pretty sure it will be the same for everybody. If you work on the web, there is a lot of JavaScript. There is JavaScript for everything, to improve the user experience, to improve our developer experience, to measure interactions for absolutely everything. And that's great, but another thing that is happening, at least for me, is that there is basically nothing between my machine, my local environment, and production. In just one click, ta-da, my code goes in production to millions of users. That's pretty cool, but it's super risky. We do have a development pipeline uh, with proper unit testing and code reviews. But in the end, to make this work, you have to think carefully before you code and before you land your changes. You have to think about all the existing user interactions, do not break them. You have to think about keeping the performance good. You have to think about um, the advertising still has to work because money is what makes us be all here. You have to think about all those things. And about user interactions, very often in our apps, that's what they look like. You have a billion of possibilities. Uh, there is a menu, a submenu, then there is a different option to reach that same menu somewhere else. And it's very hard to be able to uh, know all of those interactions, right? And maybe, so I'm a mobile web company, so I know that I have to test on an Android and on an iPhone. I'm probably going to test different browsers, but I, I'm just me. I can't think about all the different users and all their different use cases. And all our different users, for me, this is what they look like. There are billions of them, and they can, they're all very different. They all have very different goals, and they all want to do things very differently. And it's very hard to think about them, is my point. And now, Okay, birds are great, but in real life, who are all our different users? First of all, blind persons. Yeah, they go on the web as well. And if we do our job right as web developers, they shouldn't have any problem navigating just the same way as we do sighted persons. Then, well, maybe they're not completely blind, but they just need to zoom in to the maximum to see our apps properly. Again, they shouldn't have any problem if we do our job properly. Um, deaf persons can also go on the web, and if we do our job properly, they should be able to enjoy the same jokes on YouTube or the same news channels as we do without any problem. And persons with motor disabilities do amazing things, right? Don't ask me to play basketball, but they should also be able to go on the web, which is a simple task for us without any problem. They're probably going to need a very big uh, clicking targets because maybe they have tremors or maybe they have only one arm, but it should work out for them. So keyboard interactions is one of the main uh, things that persons with disabilities need, but it's not just those different users. 
It's also, for example, if you just broke your arm, okay? If you broke your right arm and you can't do anything uh, anymore for two months, does that mean that you just stop going on the web? Hmm. Or maybe you're a magic mouse user and it's out of battery. Hello, does that mean that you just can't work for an afternoon? Doesn't sound right. And so I, told, I talked about deaf people who need subtitles. Okay, but it's not just them who need subtitles. Maybe you just moved in a country and you don't understand the language. That doesn't mean that you can't, um, that you can't get the news or get the same cultural references as your colleagues. Or wouldn't it be awesome if all those persons in the metro had uh, headphones, who don't have headphones, had subtitles so that they don't have to put the sound on while they're in the metro with us? And finally, clear clicking targets, like for persons who have motor disabilities. Well, the other type of user who needs those clear clicking targets is just users who don't have time for you. They want to do something. They don't care that your UX is delightful. They just want to get the task done and find where it is. Great example is the color, like we talked about in the previous talk. All right, so that's web, ac uh, web accessibility in web development. Now, what about JavaScript? What space does it have? Usually, it has a really bad role. Yeah. When you add JavaScript to an app, it's usually going to make everything explode accessibility-wise. Let's see what you can do with JavaScript. Um, when you have an HTML button like that, you use semantic HTML, it's great. To leverage that button and know when the user clicks it, it's pretty easy. You can just um, listen for the, event, for the button click. The click is also valid for keyboard because it's semantic HTML, everything exists by default, it's awesome. And you just do whatever you want when the user has clicked on it. But now, if you decide that you don't use semantic HTML and you just do everything with JavaScript because JavaScript is great, well, you need to add a bunch of attributes to make it work. But then, this is the JavaScript you need to reproduce the same functionality as before. So, yes, you can do it, but let's be realistic. We're going to forget half of those when we actually try to do it. So, when I see this, what I want to do as a developer is to stick to semantic HTML. Like, yes, this works. I'm sure it works, no problem. Then, unfortunately, there are designers next to me, and they will kill me if I don't put some CSS. Fair enough, I add my CSS. But then, I have product managers, and they need user interactions. They won't let me go if the app is just static without any user interaction. So today, I will imagine that you're experts in semantic HTML. I won't talk about it one bit. I will imagine that you're experts in CSS. Uh, I won't talk about it one bit. You know everything about color contrasts, flexbox, whatever. And we'll focus on the JavaScript part, how to make it accessible with JavaScript. Demo time, I have two demos for you today. The first one, I call it your standard navigation menu. It's, uh, so I have this example website where you have, uh, you have can I see? yeah, great. You have the, those uh, two uh, na naturalists on the top, and you can navigate. It will open a bunch of uh, links with the paintings, and you can select go the, whichever paintings you want. So I will use only the keyboard in the demo. You can just pay attention on the bottom left. You will have left, yes. You will have the keys that I press. So I start on the very top of the page, I use the tab key, I focus on Jean Dubon, great. And then I can use the tab key again and I go through each link. That works. It's very slow. To reach Anselmus de Bort, I have to tab through everything. And then finally it opens. And again, I can tab through every individual link. It's very slow. And finally, I reach the main content of the page. Okay. And I can tap back, and I get back in the navigation. I can continue. That's it. I can't do anything else here. So this works. It's pretty low on JavaScript. It works. It's fine. This is the structure it has. 
so first I have a menu bar, which is my top level list containing my two main um, painters. Then I have a menu bar item. So this is, you will have guessed it, each item of this list, each painter individually, and they each contain the pop-up menu, which is the list containing all the individual paintings from those authors. And finally, at the lowest level, I have my menu items, which are each individual links pointing to each individual uh, painting. All right, that's great. Now, the way it's built, it's very simple. In my menu bar item constructor, so in each uh, painter level, I have four event listeners, mouse over, mouse out, focus, and blur. And um, I will just open my, my pop-up menu when I focus on them. So the code is actually the same for both. I set my attributes to true, and I open my pop-up menu. Super simple, like I said, it just works. So that just works, it's fine, it's okay. But now how to, make, how to go from this, which is fine, it checks all my boxes, to something that is actually worth visiting, that your users will actually want to be on and will enjoy what they're doing on your website. So same website. Except this time, which one is this? Let's see. Same website, except this time I have improved it and pay attention again to the, um, to the keys on the bottom left. You will see it's very different. I start at the top, same way. I tab in, same thing. But now if I tab again, I end up on the main content directly. So it's very easy to just find my content. And now to enter my pop-up menu, I use the down arrow key. And I can keep using the down arrow key to go through each link one by one. I can use the up one as well if I just want to go back, no problem. Uh, I can also just use a letter if I want to find a specific animal, like C for Karakara Eagle, and it just works. Now, if I want to jump to the other painter, I can use the right arrow key, and it works just the same way. I can go down, back, up. I can use a letter, no problem. Um, and I exit with the escape key. So I call this version taking advantage of the keyboard. It's basically stop thinking that the only thing on your keyboard is the tab key. You have a lot of other keys. Your users have a lot of other keys and let's use them. Let's give them the opportunity to use them the same way that they use them on their OS directly. So this is the structure. It's actually exactly the same, so I won't go over it again. And in my constructor, I have the exact same four methods, so great. Except now, on my handle focus, I'm not doing anything. I'm setting has focus to deal with my CSS or whatever, but I'm not opening the menu. Instead, I'm adding a fifth uh, event listener, which is key down. So I'm going to listen, listen to all the key presses and decide in function of them, in function of what it is, what to do. So my handle key down is basically a giant switch. It's not the best architecture ever, but it works. And the one thing that is important for you to notice on the, on the structure of it is that depending on the, um, on the key that is pressed, I will let the event bubble up or not. So either I will grab the event and deal with it myself, or I will say, okay, stop. Um, I'm not doing anything, and this is for the browser to deal with. So first, the most obvious feature that we need is to follow the links when the user uh, presses the return key. So here it is. I'm actually simulating a mouse event to do it so that both mouse users and keyboard users end up in the exact same place. I'm letting all the browser uh, deal with all the interactions, all the, um, you have to change the address bar, you have to navigate. I don't want to deal with that. So browser does all the heavy lifting for me if I use a mouse event here. Then I have four ways of opening the pop-up menu. I showed you one of them using the down arrow key, but I could have also used the space key as if my uh, link was a button. And two different keys that I want to pay special attention to because if you're like me, you only have a laptop, so those keys actually don't exist. But 
In fact, your users are probably on the normal desktop at home, so they're going to have those keys. Think about your users again, even if they don't look like you. Now, other way to open my pop-up menu with the up arrow, and this time I would open it, but from the bottom, from the bottom up instead of from the first link. And same with the end key or the page down key, opening the menu, but from the bottom up. Now, I showed you this one. To navigate between the top-level links between the painters, I can use the, my left and right arrow keys to jump from one to the other. And to exit the components, I have two versions. I showed them. Either I press tab, and then I close whatever is open, and I'm letting the event bubble up. The tab is living its life to do whatever it was supposed to, in my case, going to the main content. Or I press the, es the escape key, and same thing. Then this escape key is living on to do uh, whatever it has to do. And last key press is printable character, is my favorite one. It is like I showed you, if, it's, um, if it was a letter, I will listen to it and I will find for you which, uh, which link corresponds to that letter. And otherwise, nothing happens. So this is the whole uh, function, like I said, a giant switch. You can find the demo on garance.dev, and on GitHub there is the, the actual code, which actually comes from the W3 uh, examples about accessibility. So I translated it to ES6, but it's the same thing. Now, my second demo. This time, it's about focus. It's about the, how to build a dialogue interaction that works for all the other users, especially the ones with keyboard. So here's the same website, except now I'm at the bottom of the content, and I have this big I want to receive bird images button. Again, pay attention on the bottom left for my key presses. So I start right before. I enter my button that will just be with, uh, with the uh, return key. I start my focus on the first input of the page, the name. Great. Well, maybe I don't type anything. And I go to the About Us page. Now my focus is on this first paragraph, which is actually not a focusable element, but the Back to Address Form button is pretty far down. And then, well, I read everything I have to read on this page. Great. I can tab, go to the back to the main dialog. I'm back here. I can jump button, go on Add. Here's a new model that opens, and that's it. I can place, hit OK, and I'm back on focus on this main button. So that's the structure for this. I have focus. Like I said, it's all about focus. It's so important that focus management has its own class. Then I have dialogue. I'm going to create a new instance of it every time uh, the user sees a new dialogue opening. And finally, I have my controller accessible model. It's going to deal with all my event listeners and orchestrating which dialogue has to be opened when. So first, let's get this one out of the way. From any dialogue at any point, I can press the escape key, and it will just close it. Like last time, this is just about reproducing affordances that the user uh, knows. If you press the escape key, you're exiting. And then I can open the dialog. And if I do, well, I give my current dialog ID, my, where I want to be focused when I close, and where I want to start my focus. So that's what it looks like. Yeah, you see, well. So when I click on the main big button, I want to receive bird images. I give main dialog as my dialog ID. And focus after closed, back on this big button. I don't give any focus first, because there's an input, so it's obvious it's right here. It's going to be the default. Then if you click on About Us to open this pop-up with a lot of text, well, again, the dialog ID, the more info dialog. Um, the focus after close is the event target, so back on this button again. And this time I'm saying I want to focus on this paragraph. Even if it's not a focusable element, it's on the very top of the dialog, and this way the user still knows where he is, what's happening, where did he jump to. And finally, that last button, add, I'm saying I'm not using open dialog, but replace dialog this time, because I don't want to open one more on top of the others. So my dialog ID, 
I am uh, not giving any focus after closed because I'm just replacing the first dialog. So not saying anything here. And focus first, the close button. So the replace dialog, this is how it works. Instead of creating a new instance of the dialog this time, I will just replace. And the new focus after closed is undefined. No problem, I'll use whatever the previous dialog had. Great. Now, a uh, small um, note that I won't show you because it's a bit messy to explain on slides. An important thing is to trap the focus so that when the user tabs through all the dialogues, um, it doesn't end up with focus on something that is on your background page. You can see it on the GitHub repository if you're curious. And this is not so much about web accessibility, but remember to clean up your event listeners. When an element uh, just disappears from the page, we shouldn't be listening for anything regarding it anymore. So again, all the demo is on garance.dev, and on my GitHub, you can find all the code for it. And again, it's actually code from the W3. I'm just adapting it uh, with my own content. So to finish, I want to encourage you to actually try it out, to go on your computer and on your browser and to actually see what it looks like to navigate with a keyboard and to test your own apps and websites. For this, yeah, for this, you have a lot of tools. I'll just show you a couple. Lighthouse, it's a Chrome extension. It also exists on the command line. Uh, you might know it for testing performance, but it actually also has an accessibility section. So just check the box to see where your app stands. If you're at 50%, 80%, 100, let's see. Uh, Wave is also a browser extension. It exists for Chrome and for Firefox, and it's also an online tool, and it will tell you OK, so if you have accessibility errors, but also if, um, if you actually do good things on your website. So it makes you feel a bit better about yourself, you know? It's not just the bad things. And finally, Pali is really cool to include on your command line, uh, on your development pipeline, just to check. Like we check for performance and it can break the build. Why not do that with accessibility? That's it. This is the QR code for the feedback. Please go ahead and leave me messages. All right, thank you very much for that talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Or do you just run to lunch? Yeah, people seem hungry. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, hi, nice talk. Uh, I just want uh, to ask, uh, how do you make your choices when you decide which buttons to use uh, to navigate through your application? Um, usually, it's about finding what users are used to. Because, for example, on Windows, if I'm going through the Start menu, uh, using the up arrow will bring me back to the bottom of the list. So it's about finding what is usual and reproducing it. Then, if you're inventing new things, Ideally, we should also have a little explanation te text for the user to know what he's doing. I don't have any great answer to this, where, except maybe go check on the W3 website to know what they say is the norm, and I feel like you can trust them, to be honest. Any other questions, or are all your websites completely accessible from the keyboard? They are? OK, in that case, thank you, Garance. And thank you very everybody, much. enjoy the lunch. We'll see you back here with the next talk at 3 PM. <laughs>